Well, last Thursday, we reported to you that a group of political activists and journalists testified in a New York court about why they're suing the Obama administration over the National Defense Authorization Act, or the NDAA. Now, the seven plaintiffs, including Chris Hedges, Daniel Ellsberg, and Noam Chomsky, they argued that not only does the provision of the NDAA that allows for indefinite military detention allow the U.S. government to arrest civilians all over the world and skirt due process, but the loosely defined key words of supporter of terrorism or associated forces, those threaten free speech and could even affect journalists reporting on this so-called war on terror. Now, here's Naomi Wolf speaking about this last Thursday at a press conference held after the hearing. You know, the journalists up there, serious journalists, we're not saying they're going to come get us tomorrow. They're saying we're already experiencing a chilling effect. And informally, anecdotally, I'm hearing this from many, many journalists when they're honest, uh, you know, across the country. It's changing how we do our work. So that's the harm, that's the legal standing, and that's why um, I think that this is an important case. So tonight, let's speak to one of the plaintiffs in person. Here to discuss it with me is Chris Hedges, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter and senior fellow at the Nation Institute. He's also author of his latest book, Death of the Liberal Class. Chris, thanks so much for being back on the show tonight. Thank you. Uh, you and I have spoken about this before, shortly after you first decided to pursue this lawsuit uh, against the Obama administration. But, I mean, let's talk about this, right? You and I have spoken about how this is an incredibly troubling and really scary step that now you can allow for the indefinite military detention, even of U.S. citizens, despite, of course, a promise uh, by the president that he wouldn't do it. But this is a big deal. So why are there only seven plaintiffs? You know, why isn't this the biggest lawsuit we've ever seen? Well, first of all, the NDAA has received very little publicity, uh, including by my former employer, the New York Times. Uh, it is a piece of legislation that uh, was essentially supported by our, 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 our two political parties, by both parties. And indeed, the sponsors of the bill are Carl Levin, a Democrat, and John McCain, a Republican. Uh, there was no uh, outcry within the, uh, the, the systems of power itself. And that, of course, meant that, that uh, there was no outcry uh, within the media, which allows those systems of power to set the parameters of all debate. And that's why. Uh, it is an extremely frightening piece of legislation uh, because of, as you pointed out, the sort of uh, vagueness of the language itself. What does substantially supported mean? I mean, what does supported mean? What does substantially mean? Uh, what is the end of hostilities? You can seize American citizens who are accused of uh, covered persons, is the term, of uh, either substantially supporting al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or what they call associated forces. Again, a term that is not defined. And I think one of the most telling moments in the trial on Thursday was at the end of the day when Judge Forrest asked the government attorneys uh, directly, more than once, several times, uh, would this legislation permit the government to detain any of these plaintiffs and in question after question after question the assistant attorney uh, Ben Torrance uh, refused to offer those kinds of guarantees uh, so they couldn't answer the question right did, you, they, did the judge ask him to say can you define specifically what an yes, associated the judge forces of al-qaeda precisely and and they would not define those terms uh, because they can't those terms are expandable and I think when you referred to the president's signing statement which uh, he issued, it, it's very important to realize that that has no legal standing. And in the signing statement, the promise is that his administration would not use it. But uh, there is nothing in that signing statement to prohibit the government from using it, and certainly, uh, most importantly, for future administrations, from using that mechanism to, uh, to carry out, in essence, acts of extraordinary rendition on American soil against American citizens. I mean, let me bring up another uh, example here too, right? Uh, so we hear Al Qaeda and associated forces. Does it necessarily? When we start asking about these very vague definitions of what an associated force is, let's talk about the MEK, right? Right now we see uh, really a massive campaign to get MEK delisted right. off the State Department's list of terrorist organizations. Some of the people that are pushing for this are former, uh, you know, mayors, former officials within the government. They've actually taken money at speaking events. And now right. we've actually seen an investigation launched into this because of a Supreme Court ruling that says you can't provide material support to right. these organizations. But could MEK be considered an associated force of well, al-Qaeda? Well, MEK is, is on the terrorism list. Uh, and it hasn't been lifted yet. 
Uh, exactly, but so it could be but any I, organization right, on the list. Right. Well, it, or what's an associated force? It could be any organization on the list, and lots of other organizations that aren't on the list that are considered associated forces. This is the problem. And as somebody, I spent 20 years as a foreign correspondent, and when we went through the terrorism list, there were 17 groups on that list, including Al Qaeda, that I have had as a reporter direct contact with. And there is no provision in there to protect journalists at all, or anyone. Anybody can be swept up under this. Uh, and you don't want to hand these kinds of powers to the state because history has shown eventually they will use it. And, and I think finally it's important to understand what we are already seeing, which is an attempt to take Occupy and U.S. Day of Rage and other groups, uh, and this was when they released the WikiLeaks, uh, five million emails of Stratfor, the private security company. We saw in those emails an attempt to link U.S. Day of Rage directly to jihadist groups and Al-Qaeda. That's the route you're going to go. When you create a surveillance state of this size and this magnitude, and I covered East Germany, I lived in East Germany, the Stasi state, uh, they have to perpetuate themselves and they do it through inanities and absurdities and false narratives and careerism and, and, and I think that those of us who brought this lawsuit understand finally that this is not about the other, it's not about them. It's about us and but that's why it's, it's passed on everywhere. When you talk about the U.S. Day of Rage too, it could be something uh, as the U.S. Day of Rage may have gotten posted on a website, right, that was considered right. a jihadist website, and therefore, if they think that there's a tie between the U.S. Day of Rage and the, j the jihadist website, then they can monitor the Occupy movement, and it becomes well, that, this, and this we, vicious we've circle. We've already seen from the Stratfor, uh, the Stratfor uh, email releases, they've already done that. And, and, and Alexa O'Brien, who is one of the plaintiffs, lost her job, because after these kinds of accusations, U.S. government officials went to her employer and made investigations or, or queries about her. Uh, and she was pulled off projects and then eventually pushed out of her work. That, that is uh, an example of the kind of world we are entering if we are not able to strike back against this legislation. What do you think your chances are of actually winning? Well, you're, you're trying to you know, read the mind of the judge, and that's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I think but she, based on national security, right. I, I uh, the that, way that we've uh, seen these she, things I think she'll out. have a hard time denying standing. Uh, the lawyers, Carl Mayer and Bruce Afron, would like her to impose a temporary injunction, which essentially declares the, that section, 1021, 1022, uh, unconstitutional. Uh, the government, of course, would challenge it. Whether she'll go that far, I don't know. Uh, from the questions, I think... Um, that, that's a, that's uh, what we're going to have to see. I don't know. And so then, what happens if you do lose? Do you, do you try again? Well, uh, do uh, you just have to give up and say, that's it? This is a scary state that we live in now? Well, uh, I think what you can do is go back and find. It depends if I have standing, if I don't. You know, th that's the first question. Uh, you can file. You can get more plaintiffs. You can file again. Um, uh, I mean, it's certainly a blow if we lose. Uh, I don't think that there's any question that this law is, uh, you know, uh, violates the most basic tenets uh, of our constitutional right to due process. Um, I, I just don't see that, you know, that's unambiguous. Uh, whether the courts uh, will stand up to defend the Constitution or not, you know, especially uh, given, uh, you know, what's happened within the U.S. legal system, I, I really think we, we don't know. Okay, and lastly, uh, you know, at the beginning of the interview, you said that part of the reason this isn't a bigger lawsuit, isn't the biggest lawsuit in the country right now, is because the media hasn't given it a lot of coverage and because it was approved, uh, you know, by both parties. Right. They were pushing for it. But at the same time, this element that you bring into it, that journalists could also be at risk because of what you do, because of covering this war on terror, right? right. And, uh, and if you want to give everybody a voice, then you're probably going to have to at least try to talk to some people that the government won't necessarily like. So in that sense... I would feel like the media would be covering it more, like more journalists would be concerned right. if there's they know that it could affect them. There's probably not a lot of journalists who have had my extensive contact with groups like Hamas or the PKK. Um, are you really talking about a very small handful? Uh, and, um, and so it's not a large pool to draw from, and those who are still employed would need to get permission from their employers to do it, and so far we have not seen within the major media organizations the kind of interest in this law that I think they should have shown. Well, I couldn't agree with, uh, with you more on that one. Chris, thanks so much for joining us tonight. Thanks a lot.